the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, let's move into Jonah chapter 3. And, you know, as if you go back to chapter 2, chapter 2 ends with uh, Jonah being vomited out of this great fish onto the dry ground. Uh, and as I explained, the vocabulary is very important because the, the word for dry land or dry ground is the same word used in Genesis when God separates the waters from the dry ground. Uh, and so in, we begin chapter 3, and as we go through chapter 3, um, I want to give you a little bit of a roadmap before we get started. So look at this. God is giving Jonah a second chance. Uh, and also, uh, he's going to get the opportunity to go preach to the people in this great city, Nineveh or Nineveh. And, and as he goes through this great city, the people are going to listen to him before he even finishes. I mean, he's not even going to get one third of the way through and they're all going to listen to him. And not only that, but the, the king will listen to Jonah as well. This is amazing because the Israelites rejected their prophets. And their prophets were uh, most often persecuted, ignored, rejected by the kings. So you see the exact opposite of what Israel did. And to make it worse, it's their Gentiles. It's, it's their, their enemies who are Gentiles. So not just Gentiles, but Gentiles who are their enemies. And so let's look and see what happens in chapter 3 when Jonah goes to preach. The word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breath. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he cried, Yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Then the tidings reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, and covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he made proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them cry mightily to God. Yea, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows? God may yet repent and turn from his fierce anger so that we perish not. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God repented of the evil which he had said he would do to them and he did not do it. Now, let's go back and look at what happened here. The first thing I want to say about chapter 3, chapter 3 in Jonah is an absolutely amazing chapter. Everything that happens in this chapter should have happened in Israel. It should have happened in Judah, but it did not happen. So when you read chapter 3, you suddenly see, look at this amazing ideal of repentance, com a complete turning away from sin, an absolute um, uh, you know, profound reverence of the Lord, a reverence for God's word, a reverence for his prophet, king, and people. And it even becomes the law of the people through the king. All of this should have occurred in ancient Israel, in the kingdom of Israel, and in Judah. But it never occurred. So this is absolutely amazing. You know, you might be able to go and look at some good kings, like you can look at Josiah, Hezekiah. Um, but even if you look at Josiah, who was a righteous king, 
he wasn't able to turn the tide completely. If you go to uh, 2 Kings chapter 22, uh, towards the end of the chapter, the prophetess Hulda comes and she speaks with Josiah and she essentially says, you're doing good work and you're gonna continue doing good work, but guess what? Sin is out of control. This is a paraphrase of what she says. And so um, even Josiah, a righteous king in Judah, couldn't change the course of events. Even Hezekiah, a righteous king a few generations before Josiah, couldn't change the course of all these events. And so what's amazing is, look at what these Gentiles are doing, the enemies of Israel, and how they can repent, and, and they do it right away. They, they don't, it doesn't take them very long. Jonah doesn't even get one-third through the city. So let's go to chapter 3 and look at, the, look at these verses here. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Notice the concept of the word of God coming to Jonah as a prophet. The first time the word of the Lord came to Jonah, he was disobedient. Now it's coming to Jonah a second time. God is giving him a second chance. And how many times have we been disobedient to the Lord, to the word of the Lord? And so he tells Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. And so God is giving Jonah a second chance. What's also amazing is when you look at the vocabulary in chapter 3 and you compare it to chapter 1, often the same words or the same phrases, sometimes even the same sentences are used. Now, this is intentional. Uh, repetition in the Hebrew Bible is often very intentional, and, and repetition is important. Whenever we see anything re repeated, words, phrases, or even complete sentences, the reader should take note, and, and what we should say is, wow, there's something theological here that's very profound. Exactly that. Uh, the repetition is used to underline how the Lord is giving Jonah a second chance. So we go to chapter 3, verse 3. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Huh, he went the right direction. He didn't go the wrong direction this time. He went according to the word of the Lord. Now there were other prophets that went outside of Israel. Who were those other prophets? You might remember Elijah going north of Israel, outside of Israel, because there was no faith in Israel. And you also might remember Elisha going north as well to Syria. And so they were obedient, of course. There was a lack of faith in Israel. And so God allowed his prophets to go outside of Israel and preach to Gentiles during the ministry of Elijah and Elisha. And so now Jonah is doing the same. He arises and he goes to Nineveh. And it says in verse 3 that Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. You know, how are they measuring three days? We're not really sure um, because, you know, it was, it was a city that had amazing walls uh, but maybe, maybe he had to go through every single street. Maybe this is the suburbs that are outside of the walls. We're not really sure. But it's a large city. It's the capital of the greatest empire in the world, the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians were known for their cruelty. They were very cruel. And you can understand why Jonah did not want to forgive these people, why he wanted to see the destruction of this city because he knew the cruelty of these people. It really tells us something about God's mercy that is shocking for us. The, God's mercy, it, 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 uh, it, it can sometimes even seem scandalous to us. How could God forgive a people that are guilty of such great bloodshed? And so in verse 4, Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. So he's about one-third through. He's going a day's journey. And he cried, yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Notice the number 40. The number 40 is, is a number associated often with preparation, and it's also associated with judgment. So you may look back that uh, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights during the time of Noah, judgment. Uh, 
It also, um, we find 40 associated with preparation. Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights uh, up on Sinai as he received the commandments from God. He had to do that twice, by the way, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. The Israelites were in the desert for 40 years. You see kind of an image of judgment uh, associated with 40. Um, Elijah, uh, when the angel came to Elijah at night and fed him with this special bread from heaven, strengthened by that bread, he walked for 40 days and 40 nights back to Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai as associated with Horeb. And, you know, here's kind of like a preparation for, you know, the, you know, for the, the last part of Elijah's ministry. So 40, it's often associated with judgment, with preparation. Um, and here we have a period of 40 days. Prepare, because if you're not ready, God is going to overthrow this city. So he cries out and he says, in 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. Also, I, I, I have forgotten that Jesus, when he began his ministry, he is fasting for 40 days and 40 nights as well. Uh, there's, there's kind of a period of preparation there as he begins his ministry. He's in a sense, reliving some of the history of Israel. And then uh, we often forget that um, after Jesus' ascension into heaven, he was, he was with the church for 40 days. For he appeared Over a period of 40 days, he appeared a few times to his disciples, uh, and then he ascended into heaven. And then 10 days later is the day of, of Pentecost. Uh, so we see this number 40 occurring in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, especially a time period of either 40 years or 40 days. And so Jonah preaches, uh, in 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. And, am and what's amazing is verse 5, and the people of Nineveh believed God. Uh, it, doesn't say, it doesn't say Yahweh, it doesn't say the Lord, it just says God. So it's, it's, it's a little bit more general. These are pagans, they don't really know Yahweh. They don't know, they're not in relationship, they're not in covenant relationship with the God of Israel. But what's amazing is, is that given the chance, they believe immediately. They immediately believe. They proclaim a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least. And so it, it, the, the expression from the least to the greatest, it's universal. Every single one of them wants to turn away from sin. Uh, and then it says in verse 6, it says, the tidings, the news reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne. He got up off of his throne. He stopped everything. He removed his robe. He humbled himself by removing his robe. It's a, a sign of humility. He covered himself with sackcloth, another sign of, of repentance and humility. And he sat in ashes. The sitting in ashes, it might remind you of Job when he sat in the, the, the trash heap, the ashes. And he made a proclamation and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. This is really a, a strict fast right here. So a couple things about this fast. What's really interesting is not only is it humans, but it's also their animals as well. Um, you get the sense of, you know, how, how sin has, a, you know, it affects, you know, all of creation. You, you go back to Genesis and you, you look at the sin of Adam and, and, and uh, you, you look at throughout salvation history how this sin is spoken about. And not only did it affect humans, but it affected all of creation. And when you get to Romans chapter 8, Paul talks about how all of creation is groaning. It's waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. Um, and so, in some way, all of creation is suffering from this sin. Sin has this ability to affect more than just the person who committed the sin. Um, it, it's the prophet uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah who said that, you know, that, um, that, you know, never again would this proverb be repeated in Israel. Our fathers have eaten green grapes, therefore our teeth are on edge. But every man would suffer personally for his own guilt. Don't try to blame it on anyone else. And so even though sometimes, you know, we can look at original sin and we can look at the sin of our first parents and how it, how it had this far-reaching effect, 
when you get to the books of Ezekiel and Jeremiah, it's made very clear, you know, don't blame anybody else for what you're suffering. You're, go- you're going to suffer personally for what you've done. Um, and so don't try to pass the buck, you know, so to say. But, he, but, but going back to the king of Nineveh, you, you see this, this great desire to completely repent. And so not only men, but even the beast are not going to eat anything or drink anything. And so scholars will say, this is a very extreme fast because there's different ways you could fast. You could fast from just food or you could fast from just drink. And here they're fasting from both food, from food and water and it's man and it's beast. And so what else does he say? In verse 8, he says, let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them cry mightily to God. So humble yourself be- before God and cry mightily to God. Notice once again, it's not the Lord. It's not Yahweh. They don't know Yahweh, but they're going to cry mightily to God. And, and, and it goes on in verse 8. It says, yea, let everyone turn from his, from his evil way and from the violence which is in his hand. So turn away from every form of sin. This is the repentance that Israel should have done. Verse 9, who knows? God may yet repent and turn from his fierce anger so that we perish not. So verse 9, when you look at verse 9, look at this great faith. The, 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 this faith in the preaching of Jonah is so great that they're willing to take a chance. You know, we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do everything we can, and we're just going to put it out there. And, and who knows, maybe God will turn away from this. They're, they're willing to do all this and take a chance that the God of Jonah is merciful. And this is what's amazing. Israel knew that their God was merciful. But these pagans, these Gentiles, these enemies of Israel, they don't know, but they're willing to take a chance. Just, you know, who knows? Maybe the, maybe the God of Israel will be merciful to us. Maybe this, this God will be merciful. If only Israel had just, you know, an inkling of this faith. Oh, yes. If only they just had a little bit of this faith, they would have turned away. So verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God repented of the evil which he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So God accepted this action of repentance by the enemies of Israel. And this is a stunning verse. It's really amazing because, you know, this is what Israel should have known all these things. They saw so often in their history how God gave them a second chance. But they didn't turn away. And here's these pagans who don't even know the God of Israel. But at the preaching of Jonah, they turned away from their sin. So there's a lot of irony in chapter 3. When you read it, you you have to just kind of meditate on the salvation history uh, of Israel. All of the times that they refuse to repent and think, Wow, if they had only responded in this way, they would have been completely restored. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.